Hi, I'm Christine Carbo, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Everybody, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You know we're uh, we're quickly approaching 400 episodes. Uh, it, it blows my mind to uh, look back and think about the shows that we've been able to do, and looking at the calendar uh, at the shows that we have scheduled. Really, really phenomenal stuff coming up. It it's amazing uh, to me sometimes to think about uh, the amount of people that we have not talked to yet on the show, and uh, you know Don keeps scheduling excellent authors uh and from every genre uh, just about every day so uh, thank you for tuning in and listening and just because we're about to hit 400 episodes does not mean we're slowing down anytime soon so uh be sure to go over to hankgarner.com and subscribe to the show there's handy links in the sidebar where you can subscribe on your favorite uh, podcast uh, app on your phone on your computer wherever you do it you can find links there. You also uh, find us on YouTube. There's a link in the sidebar as well. I'd like to thank some sponsors who faithfully uh, support the show and allow us to do what we do. One of those is Scott Woodley from MarloMoss.net. Scott is an excellent editor and, uh, you know, authors, what you don't know can hurt you. Uh, a lot of times we think that, uh, you know, you can just do a cursory read over and then hit that publish button I can tell you from experience that even, you know, uh, having proofreaders and, uh, you know, going over it yourself, things still fall through the cracks no matter how attentive to details you are. That's why you need an editor who can come in and give you uh, that other set of eyes and who understands the the story process to help you make your story the best it can be at marlomoss.net. Uh, Scott uh, will give you a free sample edit and he can show you. Uh, how he can help your story be the best it can be. You can go to marlomoss.net uh, today and you can read some testimonials and uh, see how he uh, can help you turn your sentences into inspired sentences and polished paragraphs for print-worthy books. Uh, he has competitive rates and always delivers on time. Uh, he offers a full range of editorial and ghostwriting services to self-published and traditionally published authors. Turn your ideas into words and see your dreams Become books. MarloMoss.net. Also, I'd like to thank Richard Thomas uh, for sponsoring the show. Richard has uh, an online fiction writer's course at the University of Richard. And uh, there's a link in the show notes. There's a banner uh, there where you can click on and you can see the course guide. Uh, lots and lots of classes coming up. He can help teach you to be the best writer you can be. Uh, there's classes coming up for the 2018 and 2019 season, like short story mechanics, writing flash fiction, contemporary dark fiction, advanced creative writing workshops, uh, how to write a novel in a year, lots and lots of stuff from a very uh, prolific and excellent writer, Richard Thomas, teaching you how to be the best writer you can be. It's the University of Richard. There's a link in the show notes. I'd also like to tell you about a new sponsor, George Kramer and his new book, Blind to Blood. Ben Bergstall had a unique job. He was a tissue procurement specialist. When someone died, he would surgically remove people's body parts for donation. He really enjoyed doing it. So much so when an anonymous email asked him to consider recovering people's body parts on the side, he was more than happy to oblige. The trouble was Ben sought out live people to fulfill his clandestine client's needs. Read all about Ben's exploits in this riveting book that delves into tissue procurement, Blind to Blood by George Kramer. Pick up your copy today on Amazon and find out why people are saying this is an intense page turner, uh, that they are also 
fascinated by digging into the mind of Ben and finding out how he works. If you would like to see a look into the darker side of humanity, pick up Blind to Blood, the riveting new page turner by George Kramer. As always, stay tuned at the end of the show for an audiobook clip from our good friend Richard Glebes, the Jason Crane series. By the way, Richard is going to be my guest on episode 400 coming up, and uh, I have been reading uh, the Jason Crane series book four uh, before anybody else has, so I'm pretty excited about that. Excellent, excellent stuff coming up, and uh, yeah, I think you're going to love it. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Christine Carbo on the show with me today. Christine has a brand new book that is out today. It's called A Sharp Solitude, and you guys, this one is one to pick up. Uh, If you're looking for that summer read that you want to take to the beach with you to kick off summer, this is the book to get. Uh, Welcome to the show, Christine. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be on. Well, thank you. I'm excited to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I'd like to say that I <laughs> that I started like in first grade or third grade. I know authors that, ha- you know, they talk about, oh, I wrote my first short story when I was in third grade or I attempted <laughs> my first, you know, play in first grade. And that is so not me. Um, it, you know, it kind of bubbled up for me a little bit later, but I remember having kind of these hankings to write, um, sort of my senior year in high school. And then they kind of followed me through college a little bit. And I remember reading this great quote from Steven Spielberg, actually, who said something to the effect of your, your dreams don't shout at you, they whisper to you. And I feel like that's really apropos for the way it worked for me. I think it was just kind of this little whisper that I had throughout the years. And eventually it got loud enough where I started to follow it and do something with it. Were you uh, were you a bookish kid? Um, Did you read a lot? You know, I again, <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed to say this, but no, I actually in the third grade was told that um, that I couldn't read very well by my third grade teacher. I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, and back in those days, the the model for teaching, you know, math and reading and whatnot was. Uh, um, at least at my school, was stand up and, you know, give us the times tables or stand up and read this in front of the whole class. And I was extremely shy. So I had um, trouble doing that. And I don't know how much of it was trouble reading or how much of it was just trouble standing up and reading in front of the whole class. But uh, for some reason, I got this notion in my head that my teacher was telling me that I couldn't read. And so I kind of got this approach avoidance thing going on with books for a long Mm -hmm. time that I had to work through when I was younger. And, and in fact, I did. And sometimes I wonder if I got a master's degree in English and linguistics. Um, and sometimes I wonder, is that all because that third grade teacher told me you couldn't like, you can't do this, so now I'm like overcome that. Oh, yes, I can. I can do this. And so, um, so I, I did read, but I wasn't, you know, again, I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't your typical, that, that typical author that, you know, read all of uh, Sherlock Holmes, all of Agatha Christie, all of everything, you know, at a young age, that was not me. Well, you you know, that's that's not a solitary experience. Uh, You're not the first person that has said that. Um, As a matter of fact, I um, uh, I'm dyslexic. And when, you know, as a kid in the in the 70s and 80s, you know, if if you had a kid that was dyslexic, the, the teacher just didn't know what to do with them. So you just kind of yeah. put them in the corner and, you, you know, give them other stuff to do. And my my ultimate fear was standing up in front of people and reading out loud uh, oh, because so I, I, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you learn to uh, and there, there are things that you learn to do to, to survive in, in reading. But reading out loud is a completely different muscle. And. And oh, it was so embarrassing. I would stumble over words and, you know, it's just, it was horrible. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, but there, there were things that I discovered later and that kind of unlocked it for me. And, uh, you know, some, some science fiction, even comic books when I was younger that, uh, 
that kind of uh, cracked the code for me. Um, was there something that that you discovered later on that really captured your imagination and and let you know that that there was something out there for you? Yes, um, you know that I think in in some ways I really enjoyed reading Stephen King and just really that accessible kind of writing. And, and, and when I was younger, Nancy drew, you know, very, you know, really drew me in and then mysteries, of course, you know, when I started to really take it seriously that I was going to try and produce a novel and aim for getting it published, I chose the mystery genre and, uh, um, you know, a little sci-fi as well, but not so much. I think I, I mean, I think it was mostly the mysteries that really drew me in. And then, you know, I was, I'm a sucker for just kind of the slice of life, non-genre stuff as well. You know, the, the Oprah book club sort of books that were very popular <laughs> in the eighties and yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's something to be said for popular fiction, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, people, uh, some, sometimes snobby people, you know, and they're the same people that, that do the, the same thing with music. And, um, you know, if it's popular, it can't be, uh, right. you know, any good or entertaining. Well, it's, it's probably popular for a reason, you know, and there's uh, there are exceptions, but yeah, I, I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. You know, that story that just puts you there where you're just in it. I love, I love that. And, I sometimes, and I also love, you know, the literary. I love to read things and marvel at the the art, the artiste, you know, yeah. behind. Me. But um, so, it, but it's definitely two different experiences. I kind of, in some ways, in my mind, think of it as like looking whether like looking through stained glass versus looking through clear glass. Like sometimes when I'm reading and I'm really admiring what the author is doing, and I'm very aware that that author's you know, wow, watch this author do that or watch them describe this or wow, how did that author just do, you know, when I'm in that mode, it's really very cool because I'm reading the story and also observing that. And I think you can do that with musicians too and, and, you know, and all sorts of artists. And, but it, it feels a little bit like you're looking through something ornate or, you know, through stained glass. Whereas when you're just like this, like Stephen King for me is like, uh, it's clear glass. Like I'm just in the story 100% and I'm not, um, not looking kind of I'm not filtering it through that voice of the the author. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Stephen King has this uncanny ability to uh, to paint a, a slice of life. And I, I think you used that term earlier and uh, in, in this very Norman Rockwell kind of. Uh, it, it's very comfortable, very, you, you really, you care about his characters very quickly and it just, you feel like you're kind of a, a, a tourist walking through Mayberry or something and exactly. then all hell breaks loose, you know, exactly. a, a, after you, you know, kind of care about these people. And, um, I, I, I'm, I really love that you said that because, um, you have that same ability in a sharp solitude to really drop me into Montana and make me care about this place and these people. Um, so, uh, yeah. So you said you were, you were born in Gainesville and, uh, and lived there early on. What took you to Montana? So my family took me to Montana and I was in eighth, the end of eighth grade, I believe. And, um, my father uh, was actually uh, chief of neuropathology at the University of Florida, but he just said, you know, I want to move to the mountains. So he left a really great job in Florida and said, let's let's go. I want to be in the mountains. I want to fish and hike and do all those things. And so we came to Montana to a small town named Kalispell. And, um, we came during one of the coldest winters they'd had in, <laughs> in like decades. And it was just absolutely freezing. It was like 20 below zero every day. And I was like, what are we doing here? Like this, this is not good. I do not like this, you know, leaving my friends in the beaches and whatnot. But eventually by summertime, I kind of fell in love with Montana as well and have been ever since. And, um, and yeah, it's been, it's been, you know, I've gone away to school and had different jobs in different places, but eventually I always kind of uh, found my way back to Montana and wanted to write about it. I wanted, you know, I wanted Montana to be my setting eventually because I'm so uh, familiar with it. 
you know, and I, I wanted to be authentic about how I wrote my, my stories. And I, I felt like I'd be more authentic if I wrote in the place that, that I know so well and live in. What, what was it about Montana that captured your imagination? Uh, do you think now coming from, from Gainesville, uh, that's, you know, Northern Florida, it's not exactly Miami. Um, so it's not, you know, right. you, you guys had some winter, uh, in the way that we in South Mississippi have some winter, um, not a lot of it, but you know, you, yeah, you, you do get to see, colors and yeah, yeah, yeah. But Montana, that's like hardcore winter, isn't it? Yes. And this one just this year has been super, super hard. I mean, we still just have snow lingering everywhere, patches of snow down low. And, uh, you know, you could still ski this. The ski resorts are closed, uh, but you could still ski them if you wanted to hike up and do it. I mean, that's how much snow we have this year. But um, I'm I'm wearing shorts and t-shirt by the way. Yeah. Just just to rub that in a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not going to break 50. But um, anyway, the uh, so the question, yeah, what did I find about Montana? It, I just, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's so different than Florida and from where, you know, and I missed the ocean and I missed Florida very much when I moved for a long time. And, you know, whenever I could get back to the ocean and those smells of the ocean and the um, the salt, you know, water and the smell of barnacles and the humidity. I mean, I love it. I love humidity actually to this day. Like when I get back somewhere that has humidity, I'm like, it's like going back to my childhood. I know a lot of people love Montana because it's not humid. And, but I actually, sometimes the, the dry West actually bothers me to some degree, but, um, there's just the, the vastness of it and the, the beauty of it is just so, um, incredible and the stark and it's also got the starkness to it that kind of combines with with the beauty that just makes you really kind of humble in nature's face and it's just uh it's just a interesting place to be yeah what did you discover about the people uh from montana because i would imagine that when you when you live in a place that is so difficult to live in uh, when, when the environment is trying to kill you, um, that that breeds a certain uh, a certain attitude or a certain um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for a, a certain determination in people. Um, did, did you find that to be true? Yeah, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I'm glad you said that. Because I was afraid you were going to ask me, what is that quality? And I would not have an answer for you. I like that answer, determination. I, I feel like that is that is absolutely true. I feel like that's in myself, that I've cultivated it in the years since I've lived in Montana. I remember going on a hike in Glacier National Park. And I, I don't live very far from Glacier. I kind of consider it my backyard, which is which is really great. But I remember going for a long hike and – it was kind of this insane experience where the weather turned bad. And I mean, I could write a story about it. It was like waterfalls were going backward. Like they were shooting up into the air. The wind was so, so extreme that, you know, the waterfalls were going, were going in the opposite direction. And we were off trail and bushwhacking and a little bit lost and, or a lot lost, I should say. And just, um, we were getting scared because it just wasn't good conditions. And then we were um, kind of hiking over this boulder field at one point. And I think we had a group of about five people. And one of the gals that I was with was slipping, slipping on the boulders and just really getting upset and frustrated and, and kind of panicky, like, Oh my God, I'm not going to see my children again and getting really upset. And I was just like, I was just grabbing her. I'm like, come on, come on, we're going to go. Come on. We're just, we're going to move on. That's just what we're doing. We're moving on. We're going to find our way. We're going to do this. And another person in the group, uh, a friend of mine said, you know, you're really later, uh, like a week later, we were talking about the hike. Everything turned out fine. We were able to get down and, and everything uh, thankfully turned out all right. But he said to me, you know, you're really bullheaded, aren't you? And I was like, bullheaded. And he's like, yeah, you were just on that hike. You were like, just determined we're going to push on. We're going to push on. And I never thought of it. You know, at first I was like insulted. Well, you're calling me bullheaded. And then I realized, well, okay, this is a good quality that he's talking about. This is a determination thing. 
And, um, and I kind of wonder if Montana has cultivated that in me because people, you're right. People are that way. You know, it's just that kind of, we got to move on and persevere. People were very friendly though, as well. And I think it's because we realize that we have to rely on each other and we have to, um, you know, the, 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 the vastness is so huge that in some ways you have to really take advantage of the people and the friendships and the social fabric that does exist, you know, in the small towns of Montana. I think we're less than a million people in the entire state of Montana. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely could see that, um, that there's a, a, a certain, a certain type of person that, that lives there and survives there. Um, I, I love that. Um, a, a Sharp Solitude is actually your fourth novel. Um, you, you published three others in the, uh, the Glacier Mystery series. Uh, tell us just a little bit about that series before we get into the new book and how did, uh, did how'd that series come about and how did you first get uh, published? Okay, so that series is kind of an ensemble series, I like to refer to it as, because each book is is a standalone. And what I did with my first book uh, that I um, wrote for, you know, you know, I, I think when you think I'm going to write a book, I'm going to try and get published, I'm going to, you know, I'm just, I want to tell this story. I don't think you, or at least I didn't think about a series. I was just thinking, you know, I just wasn't, I didn't have that foresight that that's what I was going to do. I was like, I'm going to write this story. And if I'm lucky and I'm fortunate and, and determined enough, maybe I can get it on the shelves. And so I had this idea that I wanted to, like I said, I want a setting almost came first for me because I knew that place was going to be very important to me and that I wanted to be authentic in how I wrote. And so many mysteries that I love take place in these really um, kind of, these places that have so much mystique, you know, the, the, the Ireland or, you know, Scotland or, you know, the countrysides there, or, you know, or really kind of happening cities where there's a lot of crime going on and a lot of, you know, uh, New York, LA, uh, Louisiana, you know, um, it's, 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 I, I just wasn't sure at first, like, can I do this in Montana? Like, and I hadn't read Craig Johnson yet or some of the, or, or CJ box yet at that point when I kind of thought I'm going to do this. And so I did, wasn't even really, I knew of them, but I hadn't read them. And I, I just thought, you know, it can be done. Obviously they've done it. They've, you know, they've captured the West somehow. And so I thought I'm just going to set this book here where I live. And I've got this great national park that millions of people around the world come to every summer. Um, you know, we have more than a million visitors every summer come to Glacier. And I thought, you know, why would you not set it there, your story there, because you love it so much. And I, I do, I've, I've hiked thousands of miles myself in Glacier National Park. And I just thought this would be a great setting because uh, I've got the federal land, which also is shared by the county land. And so I've got different factions of law enforcement that I can involve. And so I thought, okay, that's my setting. Then I thought, character. Well, who is my main character going to be if I set it here? And so I, the, this kind of this male voice kind of started speaking to me. I'm not sure why, but that was my first character, and I decided, like myself, that he would come from uh, Florida. That he would come from Florida when he was young, and of course, I got to kind of explore those how that was as a child to to move and all that. And I actually even made his father. A pathologist, uh, a physician. So I, there was some c common threads there, but the differences between fourteen and they had harrowing experience when he was a child of watching that go down and experiencing that. So years later, he's a um, special agent for the Department of the Interior, and he uh, works in Denver, and he's called into Glacier to investigate this pretty serious crime that happens there, and Glacier just happens to be the last place he wants to be. So that was my first book. It was called The Wild Inside, and um, I was able to sell that to uh, Atria Books, which is which Simon just spoke to Atria, um, and 
you know, and lo and behold, it was, um, they wanted more books. And so, and they wanted more set in the same area. And so I, uh, what I did in, at that point was I felt like I didn't want to continue my main character that was in the wild side on. Cause I felt like I played through his character arc. So I ended up plucking a pretty prominent side character that who I, I, I wrote, I write in first person mostly. And I had written, um, the main character in that first book in the guy's head as, as him first person narrative. And so one of the side characters I plucked out and put him in the second book and I was in his head for the second book. And that was called mortal fall. And then for the third book, I plucked another side character, a female this time. And I was mostly in her head for the weight of night, which was my third book. And then for my fourth book here, formula I've plucked a side character who has, happens to be an FBI agent that assists in my last book called the weight of night because a boy has been abducted from one of the campgrounds and the FBI is called the the uh, resident FBI there's two of them locally here one they were called in to help and so I introduced this female FBI agent and I was uh, really wanted to explore her character so she's the character in a sharp solitude well, that uh, that leads perfectly because I was going to ask you about these characters in in a sharp solitude. So you've got uh, the FBI agent, and you've got um, this this other character, um, and you you bring out these um, uh, these interesting um, uh, vocations uh, for characters that that probably can only happen, uh, you know, where you set them. Uh, how did you? The, the male lead and the female lead, how did you come to, uh, d- did these characters come to you? Uh, you said they were side characters. Um, were these stories you'd already been thinking about or were, were these based on, I'm being a little cagey because I want you to, I, I don't want to give away too much, but I want you right. to, to kind of tell us where, where the idea for the scenario for the setup came from. So once I kind of ha- was on this roll with, kind of plucking characters, which is, you know, not a new thing, you know, uh, Tana French does it with the Dublin murder mystery series. And, um, you know, lots of other writers have used this formula, but it just, it's a formula that really works for me. And I really enjoyed that because I just got to explore the whole character arc every time I started a new book. And I just really enjoy that. So, um, the, I kind of have that in my mind, I guess, when I'm writing that, oh, I need, you know, I may need to pluck one of these characters. And I often don't know which one, but I like (laughs) to plant enough of them that I have options when I move on. Because when you're in the middle of the book, it's some for me anyway, I I know some people are just idea bins and they just, you know, their muse is working overtime all the time. And they're thinking of books way beyond while they're writing one. But that's not me. I really can only focus on the one I'm writing about. And I just, I just cannot think of ideas for future books. I'm just in that one book. And until that's done and wrapped up or put away, I can't even really begin to think about um, future books. So I just have to hope that I plant enough characters that I'm actually going to want to spend time with once I've wrapped that book up and that I'm going to want to follow. And once I've done that, once I've wrapped up the book and then I kind of look back over like who, who might I want to develop here in this future book, um, I... Uh, I just, then I start thinking about who they are and, and, you know, sometimes they're not as well round, you know, they're, you've introduced them, but since they're not your main character, you don't, you don't really kind of completely flesh them out. So when you get that chance to start really fleshing them out, you start getting all these brilliant or, you know, what, what you think are brilliant ideas about, Oh, this person could, you know, they might have this problem or this problem or, or this, this thing in their life. And, or they might even, you know, um, sometimes you're stuck with what you've planted in your earlier book. Like you may want your main character to come from a different part of the United States, but lo and behold, you look back and wow, they're from this part of the United States. So (laughs) it's like, okay, I can't do that. I can't do that idea because I, I already said that they were, you know, and you don't want to mess with that like you know it's they are standalones but because there's that thread a little bit i have to honor that and not just suddenly 
take a character, but then give them a different history than the little bits and pieces I've planted in the previous book. So, so I like to just kind of know what I've said and I usually don't say too much, but you know, I, I, there's enough of a sketching to kind of realize that I've, I've got that sketch of a character, but now I just need to fill in the nuances and shade the shadings of them and make them more full and fleshed out. And, um, And then sometimes with that new character, then I get to introduce um, side characters that are brand new. And so with A Sharp Solitude, with this female FBI agent who I'd introduced in my third book, I was able to introduce an ex. Um, an, uh, it's not her ex-husband. It was, it's an ex-boyfriend, but she happened to have a child with this person. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it, he's more than just an ex. He, he's right. like an, an ex times two because they've got this this family connection with the, the shared daughter, which really amps up the, uh, the tension. Yes, and so she, she's very um, protective of her daughter for, for reasons that, you know, because she's a mom, because we're all protective and, you know, we're all mama bears in some way, but also she's got some backstory where with her own father and whatnot. So it turns out that her, the father of her child is accused of a crime and she kind of comes into the investigation and snoops around it, knowing it's a conflict of interest because he is the father of her child, but feeling driven to do that because she just, her her own father was in jail um, growing up when she was little, and she does not want to repeat that for her own daughter. And she doesn't feel like he's guilty anyway, but she's just, you know, there's a lot of murkiness that she has to kind of work through in her mind with him. He happens to be um, have this really interesting job that I just – read about, you know, you, it's funny, these tidbits, these things that you read about in the news. And I happen to read either on the internet or maybe in a magazine about these research, research studies that were going on in the West, um, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. Um, a lot of them, I think, were coming out of the University of Washington, where they take these canines. And, um, you know, we all know how brilliant the dogs are with, with their noses and sniffing out, you know, uh, the cadaver dogs, drug dogs, bomb dogs, you know, all sorts of dogs. Well, they also have dogs trained to go out into the wilderness and sniff out scat for certain species of animals. And they're able to do all these really great studies based on the scat that these dogs are able to sniff out and find because they're able to just get the DNA that way. And, um, you know, there's a lot that I guess, you know, the, the animal scat will tell a research. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And so that's, um, I, I gave him that profession and so that he's out in the woods a lot. And I wanted to bring that in. I wanted to bring the woods in yet have this kind of family dynamic going on. So in my mind, it's almost a little bit of like domestic suspense meets police procedural meets the wild right. <laughs> kind of book. <laughs> and, and no great murder mystery uh, would be worth its salt without a, a great murder. Um, Tell us about the the person that gets murdered that brings uh, that brings Allie uh, into this, uh, you know, that, that's try, trying to, um, you know, not let her daughter's uh, father, you know, Reeve, fall into the same thing as her father. So what what's the the setup that that sets all this in motion? So the set. who is found um, up kind of right outside the border of Glacier Park, uh, up in an area called the North Fork, um, which is just basically because of a North Fork of a river that comes down um, in that area. And she uh, is a, happens, to be, happens to have been a journalist who was working with Reeve, um, Allie's ex, out in the woods, and um, he was the last person to be with her and to spend the entire day with her and be seen with her, and so that's why he became, you know, becomes the number one suspect. And she is um, a journalist, like I said, working to get information about this dog handling program for for these scientists. However, she has, as the story unfolds, I don't want to give too much, but she kind of, it kind of, some things come out that she's maybe got some ulterior motives herself. And, 
so he ends up and yeah, I mean, I guess I don't want to say too much about that because I feel like that's kind of the fun part of the book is to figure out what what's what what the victim actually had going on. But Allie is drawn into this whole thing because Reeve because of Reeve and Reeve basically asks her for her help, like you know, help me. This is you know, help. This is you know, he's a he's an intensely private person who just wants to be left alone, and. Um, and so some of that, some of that stubbornness and, you know, his desire for privacy and to be kind of in the woods and left alone and try and kind of, um, you know, not live off the grid by any means, but kind of be a little bit of that kind of person, um, makes him miss, he miss, he just doesn't trust authority figures very well. He doesn't trust the cops and he's not, he's not the perfect, he's not a good person to be interviewed and kind of does some stupid things that make him look, make him become implicated even more. Um, Christina, a great mystery is, uh, is amplified when we really care about the characters and we feel that, uh, that, that there's something at stake. And, uh, you, you know, because if you, you know, we, I think we're, in our entertainment now, we're kind of inundated with police procedurals and, uh, and, and some of those things can become very sterile, um, yeah, because we, yeah. we see and we hear the stuff kind of over and over and over again. Um, but when you, when you feel that someone's, uh, family and life, uh, literally are at stake if you don't unravel this mystery, uh, then you have a compelling story that, that draws you in. And, and as a reader, you're, you're kind of rooting for them to, to unravel this mystery. You know, um, are, as a writer, are there any, any tools that you use, uh, consciously, or is this something that just happens in the writing, um, that helps to bond the reader with the characters so that we do keep turning the pages and we care about what's happening in their lives. Yeah. You know, I put a lot of thought into that actually when I'm kind of in that gestation period where I'm, where I haven't really, I've wrapped up the previous book. I'm thinking about the next book and what, you know, trying to figure out some premises and ideas. And um, as I'm doing that, a lot of that revolves around, this idea that, you know, that uh, you know, exactly what you've just described, that my I feel like my um, detective stories or cop stories or whatever, whichever character I'm with is going to be much more interesting if there's something. I think there was, you know, like a like a Michael Connelly quote that goes something to the effect of the best crime novels are not about how a detective works on a case. They're about how a case works on the detective. Oh, I and love that. I, yeah, I love that too. And I feel like I've always just really subscribed to that, that I want, I want my cases to work on my detectives because I find that we, they just become much more compelling and we're, we're much more caring of, the case when we know that it's also intersecting with the person that's trying to figure out the case. And so in, in bothering them and kind of um, bringing up some of their deepest stuff and maybe, maybe trauma from childhood, maybe just um, maybe not full on trauma, but just issues that, that need to be dealt with. And then I, I, I think it just becomes so much more interesting that way. Uh, well, Christine, the, the new book is called A Sharp Solitude. It's out everywhere today. Uh, and if, if you're a fan of CJ Box or, uh, that's, uh that's Craig Johnson, y yeah, those, uh, you know, I, I'm a fan of, of all of those, uh, thrillers and mysteries. And this, uh, is, uh, you know, you're, you're now on my must buy list uh, of, uh, when new books drop. Uh, so if Thank people are not familiar with you, where can they find you online to kind of follow along and, uh, and to get in, uh, you know, into your back catalog and, and all that good stuff? Oh, okay. So, uh, christinecarbo.com is my website and I'm on Facebook, Christine Carbo author. And, uh, I would love it if you followed me on Facebook or, or Twitter, uh, Christine underscore Carbo for Twitter, I believe. Yeah. 
Excellent. We'll put links to uh, to all those in the show notes and so people can connect with you. Uh, again, the book is A Sharp Solitude. Everybody, it's out today. Go pick up your copy and uh, and let's help Christine uh, uh, have a huge success on her launch. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Hedwig slipped into David's den, the circular reading room. A ladder of crude rungs protruded from the wall, remnant of its days as a grain silo. He pulled himself upward, rung by rung, until the bookcases and sofas were far below. Even if he fell and died, he didn't really care anymore. No, he did care. He couldn't die yet. She had to die first. That would make their divorce final if she wanted it so much. Darkness enveloped him. He reached the top of the ladder and stepped off onto a catwalk of black mesh, lit only by the faint light of the four square windows that encircled the turret. From this perch he could see the exit she would use. He felt like an assassin, like Lee Harvey Oswald in the window of the Texas School Book Depository. But he wouldn't use a rifle, no. Rifles leave evidence. Rifles can be produced in court. Rifles can miss. He pulled back a shroud of burlap and opened the cardboard box he'd stashed up here earlier that day. He reached into it and withdrew the only murder weapon, the only magic bullet a Van Brunt could ever need. The gold lantern flashed in the moonlight. He held it up to the window. One if by land, two if by sea, he thought. And then it's time for a midnight ride. But it won't be Paul Revere. No, not Paul Revere at all. He found the oyster knife at last. He lay his cupped palm sideways over the vent. Don't get blood on your Armani. And stabbed the blade into his palm. The blood came hot. He dripped it into the lantern, where the skull of the horseman waited to sip it like nectar. The reliquary glowed, and an incantation in Old Dutch appeared, shining from within the metal. It was time. Hedwig bent and whispered into the vents. Rise, headless, and ride. The letters vanished, and a cold white light burst from the thing. The skull wasn't just a skull anymore. It had gestated. Capillaries clung to it the way fine hair clings to the crown of a newborn. A thick, carotid artery moved with snake-like undulation, drinking blood from the pool at the base, pulling it upwards to circulate through scarlet vessels, through twisting coils, slurping the liquid greedily, the way little Zeph used to slurp strawberry Nesquik through a crazy straw. The blood pulsed and pushed into the nose, into the eyes, into the hollow cavity within the skull. But was it hollow, still? Hedwig didn't think so. He felt a mind growing there, something with a will to challenge his own. He fixed his gaze to the twin caverns of its eye sockets, speaking slowly and deliberately. Jessica Bridge. The death's head grin broadened, somehow and a thread of black and green liquid, shiny as a horsefly's wings, trickled from the gap of a missing eye-tooth. Only Jessica Bridge. Do you understand? He shook the lantern. Do you understand? The face lurched forward and struck the glass, leaving a red splash there. It wobbled and settled, smiling and nodding. Jessica Bridge, hissed the face. Yes. Hedwick raised the lantern a little. Jessica Bridge. The red face tipped backwards and the jaw cracked wide. Hedwick recoiled. Something pink and wet writhed inside that mouth. The nub of a new tongue, salivating as if it could taste the name. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge.